Here are some shocking statistics for you. Tell us more, Ruth. Well, more than three and a half thousand attacks on emergency care three staff. Three and a half thousand. Three and a half thousand, okay. Emergency care staff who are trying to help people were recorded just last year. And in the last five years, assaults on ambulance workers, in particular in England, have risen by almost a third. Now, the reason uh, Ruth's given you those stats is that uh, with us today uh, are guests who are two paramedics. They are Dina Evans and McHipgrave, who were themselves victims of an unprovoked attack whilst in the course of their duty. And Dina, this happened when? July 6th last year. July 6th last year. And Mick, it resulted, I mean, it's absolutely horrible, uh, but you had a sort of ringside view of all of this because you saw an attack on Dina before the awfulness happened to you. Can you talk us through what happened? Uh, yes, um, I, I witnessed Dina being stabbed in the chest by this uh, assailant. Um, he had two large knives in his hands and she actually received uh, two stab wounds to the chest. One was quite serious and one of a, a minor nature. So during the incident, after she'd been stabbed, I tried to protect her, uh, covered her up, and unfortunately he stabbed me as well. Horrific. I mean, horrific for you to, to watch that happening to Dina. Well, the whole thing's horrific, Dina. Yeah. You'd gone to this man's house... His uh, name Martin is Martin Smith. Smith, 52 years of age. Um, before we go on any further, he's gone down for nine years, uh, a year after that attack. Yeah, so he, it was his mother who'd raised the alarm, saying she was very concerned, she hadn't seen him, and you went with the police to his house. So tell us what happened when you got there. So the police had come with us just to force entry. There was no um, markers on the address for any violence markers or anything like that. So you that. weren't particularly worried at this no, point? No, it was like any other job. Um, we got there and we were knocking and banging and there was no answer. So we, you sort of think, well, we're going to have to get in because if something has happened, we need to get in there fast. And his mother was there with yeah. you? Yeah, and she said, please don't cause too much damage to the door because I've got to pay for the damage after. So we made the decision, it was an old UPVC door, that if we took the panels off, we could put them back on after once yeah. we were in. So we took the panel off the front door. I'd already looked through the letterbox and seen that the porch door was shut. As we took the first door off, we were sort of all stood in a line. Um, Mick was at the front. When he took the panel off, we switched places, which meant I was at the front. As we stepped through, I said, that porch door's been opened, somebody's in. But by that time, it was too late. We'd all started to walk forward. Are you calling out at this point, Dina? Yeah. So, you know, it's paramedics, hello, yeah. you're OK, we're here What is the call for? Why are you there in the first place? It was a concern for welfare. From his mother, who hadn't heard from him for a long oh, time. Right. So you, at this point, then go in first. You go through the door. Yeah, tapped on the door and I sort of said, hello, are you OK, Martin? It's the ambulance. And as I said that and I pushed the door open, he just ran at me with... And you felt knives. what? He ran at you, he had two knives in his hand, you didn't... I felt like I'd been punched yeah. to start with because you don't feel the stab wound. I just thought I'd been punched. Um, and then I remember Mick jumping in front of me and I felt him lunge forward and I thought, oh, maybe he's been punched as well. And then I thought my T-shirt was really wet and warm and I thought I got gloves on and I sort of patted myself down saw all the blood and I, that's when I, I shouted, I've been stabbed, I've been stabbed. And then I heard Mick say, me too. Oh, Mick, so he stabbed you in the back? Uh, yeah, in the kind of the, yeah. this area here, yeah. So what did the police do? I mean, this all happened when I was reading this, like in, in <coughs> seconds, 10, 12 seconds or something has yeah. been recorded. Yeah. What did the police do at that point? Well, you, it, Mick grabbed the, there was a wheelie bin and he grabbed a, a wheelie bin and threw it and it sort of made like a barricade between us because I think he would have carried on stabbing. Yeah. He just did, kept doing that. So the barricade knocked him over and I heard the police shout taser and that's when we ran into the garden. That was the only es escape. So at escape this point... At all, bleeding. Bleeding profusely, uh, yeah. Mr Smith, um, was he, Mick, was he... Are there, were there mental health issues? Was he intoxicated? Was, was there any reason for his behaviour? Um, he wasn't intoxicated um, and during the sentencing it was just highlighted that he had moderate depression in the past but nothing uh, psychiatrically severe. So there's no real reason for him to carry out what he did. Well, look, he's not alone. It's, it's not an isolated case. Could I ask you to, why do you think certain members of the public take their aggression out on the very people who are coming to help them? I think the uniform. Is, is, a, is a big, a, a, a big um, target 
to be honest with you. Uh, they seem to see people in uniform as a as a target to, to attack. Yeah. Would, you, would it help if your job wasn't in uniform? No. I think... I think it, it wouldn't. Um, I think you need to, to keep some professional yeah. identity. So, you know, um, the uniform helps most people. They see the uniform coming towards them and they know help's arrived, so... Well, you had help in the form of uniform police there. Um, I presume they were attending to you, Dina, and an ambulance had been called. Um, who was helping you and do you, what do you remember about that? So, I remember... <clears throat> I remember Mick um, helping to stem the bleeding, even though I could feel him bleeding onto me. Um, so, I was trying to hold his side, he was trying to hold my chest. And then I remember um, a female officer and, I mean, there was so much commotion going on, but I, I remember saying... I remember grabbing her collar and um, I remember saying, please don't let me die. I've got three children, please don't let me did, die. Did you think you felt you were going to die at that point? At that point, I knew I was dying. Um, and then am I right in thinking, actually, your boss... Oh, sorry, I don't mean to upset sorry, you. Sorry. I know, so shocking. Um, it was your boss heard, because you'd both hit your emergency radios, so you were on a kind of open talk back to your colleagues who could hear what was going on, and it was your boss who then jumped in the car and came down to you? Well, just before that, um, we'd pressed our buttons and we didn't think we'd been heard, so I, we've got an open channel button, and I pressed that, and I thought, right, I'll just broadcast it to everybody, and I said, please, please help, help him. I'm, I'm dying. So, so then... thinking, save him, cos I'm dying. Oh, goodness. Mick, eventually your wounds heal physically. Yeah. Uh, you go back to work, but mentally, what is all of this like? What's the legacy of this mentally? We've, um, we've both been diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from the incident. Um, we did have good and bad days uh, over the last 12 months uh, with our mental health. Um, it has improved with counselling and uh, it's good and bad weeks now. So it's had a massive effect on <laughs> our, our well-being, really. Probably more so than the physical side. It's something that you, you never forget. But then, Mick, why, why do you do the job again? I would imagine if it was me, I wouldn't want to ring another doorbell. I wouldn't want to walk through another front door. I wouldn't want to meet someone unless the police had been there first. Why do you continue to do the job in the West Midlands that you do? There were times when I did consider over the last 12 months if it was right for me. Um, but this is the job I love. It's not a job to me, it's my, it's my life. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to let this man spoil the rest of my life. He's taken a year of it and I want to go back to the job I love. I love helping people. That's why I joined the ambulance service in the first place. It's such a, you know, I'm so sorry I've upset you. It's all, all, you know, because the whole thing is just so traumatic, I know. I know you've both had treatment and counselling and, and Mick's just said why he wanted to go back. After that terrible trauma, I mean, you were showing me earlier, you've got an awful scar and scarred mentally as well. Why did you want to go back? Same reason. It's what I do and, you know, not all patients are horrible. No, no, of, of course not, of course not. But I just want to try and get to this thing. Why do those who do this do it? Why do they, you know, Sometimes what, we just where does the know. hate come from? It's, it's, it's absolutely awful. And guys, everybody in studio, let's give these two a round of applause here. <laughs> doing the and, everybody, again. and everybody who does the jobs that they do on the front line. Absolutely brilliant. Thank goodness you're there. Oh, and... Dean, I'm sorry we'll settle <laughs> it again now. Yeah. Okay. But uh, we mean that out of love and kindness and admiration. Respect to you both. Keep doing what you do. And to everybody else who works for an ambulance service or an A&E or, yeah. you know, in the police, police service and all that sort of thing, uh, thank goodness you're there doing the dirty work that no-one else wants to do. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Take thank care you of yourselves. <laughs>